Great. Well, welcome everyone to the Pearson Business Book Club. Um, if you've not seen it yet, um, we've got a poll for you to complete. Um, so please do answer the, the three questions if you can. Um, we're going to come back to that later. Um, I can see that a lot of you are already taking the poll, which is fantastic. Um, so I'll, I'll just carry on for now um, if you're thinking about those questions. Um, my name is Eloise Cook and I'm the publisher for the Professional Business List at Pearson. So I'm commissioning books and working with authors to develop their content. Um, if you're new to the book club, um, each month we choose a Pearson business or personal development book and invite the author here to discuss it. And um, they'll also give a masterclass on a sort of key, to, key concept from the book. Um, and just a just a flag that if you do need to leave halfway through, we're going to post the video for this session to the book club web page. So it will be available to view on demand. So our book today is the Mentoring Manual by Julie Starr. Um, so I've sort of shared some points about the book. Um, it's all about um, how to understand what mentoring really is, how to do it well, lots of step-by-step -step guides, and it's really practical. Um, and if you haven't got a copy yet, you can download a sample chapter of the book from the book club webpage. Um, and we also want you to use the Q&A function to ask Julie any questions. Um, so you know, as the session goes along, feel free to drop them in and we'll get Julie to answer those at the end. Gosh, yes, oh, gosh. I've done the introductions now. Um, I see that a lot of you are still doing the poll. Keep keep answering if you can. But um, Julie, hello. Hello, oh, good okay. afternoon. We got here, how lovely. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, let me give you a quick introduction first. So okay. you are MD of Star Coaching, which is a leading provider of coach training in organizations. And uh, you have over 25 years of experience and thousands of hours of coaching um, and you've been supporting CEOs and executives from all over the world um, and you also as well as the mentoring manual you are the author of two other Pearson books the coaching manual and brilliant coaching so Julie welcome thank you so much for doing this <laughs> how, how are you're you very welcome um yeah I'm good I'm good thank you yes um you and I have known each other for many years, haven't you? Um, you've been supporting know. all of those. So Coaching Manual, now in its fifth edition, it's about 20 years old, I think. Um, mentoring yeah. Manual in, is number two. I think we're just going into fourth edition for brilliant coaching. So yes, it's been a journey with all of those titles. And this one especially, it's been amazing. Yes, yes, it's 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 been fantastic, and yes, it's been it's been good to sort of see how they sort of evolve a little each time yes. we do a new edition. Yeah. So yeah. it's always very exciting. Um, we've got eight, eighty two percent of people have completed that poll. I'll, I'll just keep giving you a little nudge. Okay, <laughs> great. Come on, guys. Yeah, come on, guys. Um, so, so Julie, um, let's start. Um, you know, with my typical questions, we uh -huh. we ask we ask every author these. Um, so tell me about the, the mentoring manual. Why did you want to write this book? Yes, that made me smile when you uh, sent me the question, because if you remember, I don't think I did want to write this book. I was a bit of a reluctant <laughs> um, author on the subject initially. I, I was really cautious because I do believe as a writer, if you haven't got something different to say, something fresh, something that feels authentic and and you know a, a contribution in that whole realm of, of everything else that's available like you know and and on first glance I wasn't sure I did and so I was very glad to continue the conversation and then realize if anybody you know knows anything about me you'll know that I have you know I go to in deep into deep reflection on these things and inquiry and meditate um, the heck out of things and I realized that not only did I absolutely have something that I thought was fresh to bring to this this kind of traditional quite you know an established topic um, and there's lots of books on it but I also it not only did it feel fresh it was something that I really wanted to write about and that I did care about because we've obviously been working we were best known for our coaching uh, coach training in organizations but alongside that we do help organizations to launch and um 
and be successful with mentoring schemes because the the, the skills are quite often um, super com complementary. So, um, yeah, I, I discovered I really did want to because I felt like I did have a fresh perspective on something that that is actually an evolving, emergent topic, even for something that's been around thousands of years. I think there's, you know, there's more places to go with this. So, yeah, glad, glad to have um, written it. Certainly. I love it. I love the book. Good. Me too. Me too. And I feel that, you know, e even when it, the first edition was published, it, it felt like it was a growing topic and it, it's grown mm. so much since. Yes, it has. Really I has. think it can only continue um, that as, as people sort of understand more what coaching is and what mentoring is. Sure. So, so tell me, um, was there anything that sort of surprised you when you were writing the book? Um, yes, it was and it's something that I'll talk about. It's this whole... Um, the wisdom available in the ancient archetype of mentor. So we've obviously taken this label, this topic, and we've adapted it either for the modern workplace or you know contemporary um, life, if you like. Um, but actually, when instead of kind of starting from where we are and trying to invent new things, that there was real wisdom and insight for me in, in going backwards and starting with the kind of the, the genesis of this and, and why this is such a powerful relationship and what the distinctions and characteristics of that actually are. That that really surprised me. Mm, yeah, interesting, interesting. And finally, last question. Um, how do you want readers to feel um, when they're reading your book? Yeah, I, I in exactly the same way as with all my books, I want people to feel supported and encouraged. And I want, you know, I, I work hard to try and to distinguish um, understanding in a clear and simple and practical accessible format. So I want people to feel supported, encouraged, um, and just enabled really to, to do this thing practically so that it isn't some lofty ideal of some unique special individual that is a certain character type that people can't relate to, but actually people can recognize and connect with very quickly who they are as a mentor, who they already are as a mentor for other people and these innate qualities that are inside all of us that, that through inquiry and, and um, you know a bit of poking and prodding around we can we can all access within ourselves so yeah I want people to feel supported and encouraged certainly I love that I love that and I think you, because you've got such experience teaching people sort of one-to-one -one and in groups yes, yes. It's, it's something we 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 talk about with authors a lot that you know you might not be there when they're reading the book but we want them to feel like you are in a sense yeah and, to develop that relationship so yeah, yeah completely agree with that great Okay, so it's time for the masterclass. Um, should we? Are we leaving this poll running? I can see that. We I have... think we could probably complete it usefully to kind of find out a little bit more about who's online. It just helps us orientate a little bit. So, if somebody, Emma, could you close the poll now? Is that? There we go. Got we've got got Arma helping and behind the scenes here. Right? Should we share the result? Yes. Why not? Right. Okay. Am I sharing? Am I sharing? Yes, you, yes, you are sharing. So we've got 47% of people on here. That's wonderful for me. Um, and another 16 um, mentors in the making. Um, great that people are interested in, in the topic generally. A lot of people on that. Um, want to learn more before I decide if I, I'll be a mentor. Please be a mentor. The world needs more mentors. Um, or I'm already involved in mentoring already. So that's lovely. Um, and what's most important to understand, to understand the process, to get better mental skills. That's that's great for me because um, it just helps me understand where to, um, you know, where to emphasise the points. So thank you. Fantastic, fantastic, great, great. Well, well, Jenny, it's over to you. So okay, um, let me I'll, do I'll let the... you that you take it away and um, as a reminder um if you want to put questions in the q a for julie as we go through the session we'll be picking those up afterwards so enjoy everyone <laughs> right wonderful um okay so just before we start then let's oh. 
Let me get hold of the technology so I can actually advance my screens. No, that's it. Can everybody grab a pen and paper? I'm sure you've got something to hand. Um, we promised you today that, that, you know, this next kind of 40, 45 minutes of, of me um, would make a difference to you. And that's certainly something that has been my intention all the way through preparing this. I'm cognizant of the fact that I, I bring some theory, some simple thoughts, some ideas, some observations from my experience of working with this topic um, for many years. And um, you bring you, you bring your situation, your problems, challenges, current set of questions, um, you bring that intention, that seeking to, to gain something from it. And that's as important as anything I can do, because, you know, obviously, if you sit with your arms folded, refusing to kind of be impressed by anything because you've seen it all before, that, that's a certain level of, in, you know, filtering that we go into in terms of listening. A more um, appropriate listening would be that you have a focus to, um, to seek that you have an intention of something you want to get from today and that and the poll was just a you know a beginning of that um so the purpose of the session is to have you deepen your understanding of what it means to be a mentor for other people and and be able to relate to this personally um, so that these 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 notions aren't conceptual or theoretical but it's something that that you can realize for yourself um, to help you Id identify some areas of opportunity. So for those of you that, that are already mentoring, it, it's going to be great because you can contrast and compare with your experience to date of, of mentoring and what that's been like for you, either inside the workplace or outside of the workplace. Perhaps you've had some um, ideas, rules, prescriptive principles and process placed upon you, um, or perhaps you're kind of navigating in the desert, you know, um, unsupported. So I hope to give both, you know, wherever you are with your mentoring, I, I hope you um, to identify some areas of opportunity there. And also, um, we're hoping to get 10 minutes at the end where um, you can share your thoughts, your experiences, you can ask more questions um, and get clear. Um, and as you'll see from the banner there, let's also bust some common mentoring myths because there are a few around and it's useful um, if we are going to get clear to, to bust a few myths. Um, OK, so with your pen and paper, just to help distill your focus and your listening a little bit more on this, to this topic of mentoring, what question do you have that you want this session to answer? And if that, so that's what we call a generative question because it takes you towards something. If that isn't where you are right now, if it feels like you're more in, stuck in problem or challenge, perhaps there's a second question that you could might be able to answer more easily, which is what's your current mentoring challenge or issue that you most want to fix? So for those of you that are mentoring, there could be things you struggle with, things that frustrate you, things that you perhaps cause you to feel less, less than comfortable with um, your mentoring relationships. So the first question is, you know, what question do you have about mentoring? That could just be simple, like, am I a mentor? Could I be a mentor? Um, or where do I start mentoring? Or, you know, what could this topic be for me? Um, or for those of you that are currently, um, you know, in the depths of mentoring, maybe there's some challenge that you want, but just take the time to write that down. And there is something magical about writing these things down by hand. Um, I don't quite understand it, but the neuroscientists probably can. There's something about just write it out rather than just think it because something else happens. Um, OK, um, when we are talking to people more generally about mentoring schemes or um, becoming more successful at mentoring, there are three domains, if you like, that are useful to acknowledge when you're thinking about what can be quite an unwieldy subject, especially if you're here as part of an organisational scheme. Um, there, are, there is this domain of principles you operate from, and that could be um, rules, it could be ideas that you navigate by, and there's lots of those um, in the book and we'll be using some of those today. Um, it could be um, objectives, purpose for an overarching scheme. That could be a principle, you know, we're all doing it this way. Um, 
we've then got this second domain of process. So this, this would be the idea of a journey. So the beginning, the middle and the completion stage to an assignment or to a mentoring relationship, if that's how you think about it. But certainly when we're doing any sort of one-to-one -one work that has this beginning, middle and end, we, we see time and time again that when we have some sense of that journey and some way of supporting the structure of that journey, the, the key milestones in, in that journey, if you like, um, that we, we are automatically um, more effective. Um, and the difference would be to just start mentoring and have no idea when you're going to start, and when you're going to stop and how long this relationship is going to be and how often you're going to meet and how long the sessions are going to be. You're just going to start. That's kind of the opposite of having an effective, supportive structure. Um, skills and ability, what equips us for challenge? This is um, recognising that whilst there is no definite ideal of a, the perfect mentor, um, there are certain communication skills, there's emotional intelligence, there's there's ability and, and perhaps even experience that, that individuals can already have, they can develop, they can evolve, that equips us for this, this journey. Um, and for those of you that are part of organizational schemes, you know, th this is these are the ideas that these are the big buckets of activity and thought that need to be um, unpacked, if you like. Um, okay, so mentoring is often morphed with this is this is why i think we need to get this clear understanding of what mentoring actually is in comparison with other things because it's often morphed with it becomes this like mushy venn diagram with um coaching managing consultancy training talent development counseling succession planning skills transfer those is, in the workplace especially those are all um, adaptations that we see kind of bolted into this activity you know we're doing this because we want to develop our talent or we're doing this because we've gone to matrix management and people don't have formal line managers so we're going to give them mentors instead perhaps so just and and obviously this um this ongoing debate of the difference between mentoring and coaching will continue and i'll add my two pennies to that um, so just to recognize that whilst we can go back for the ancient archetype of what mentoring actually means, in modern day, it's, it's sort of become blended with these things, um, sometimes unusefully, sometimes usefully. Um, so let's look at this. What's the difference between coaching and mentoring? And this was almost the thing that stopped me writing the book because I, I didn't like the debate and I thought the debate was unhelpful at the level of debate that I experienced it. And it seemed to be people wanted to distinguish coaching and mentoring at the level of behavior and what people were generally saying that I, uh, I was uncomfortable with was um, coaches ask, mentors tell. So if you're a coach, it's not okay to advise or, or give guidance or ideas. Um, as a mentor, you're expected to give advice and ideas. And I thought that was unhelpful. And the reason that's unhelpful is because it's, it's not useful and it's probably not even relevant to distinguish um, the difference between these two things, coaching and mentoring, at the level of behaviour. What distinguishes the difference between these two one-to-one -one activities is the nature of the relationship is essentially different. And it's the nature of the relationship, the purpose and intentions, the, the, um, the attributes of the relationship that help give us this clarity that we can then navigate by. And, and certainly the beginning of the book um, spends quite a long time, you know, uh, goes into this in, in, with some rigor to understand what's the difference. And the other reason why it's less useful is, and it's a real practical reason, when managers are asked to be mentors for other people, if they are confused between these two things, it's less of an issue because what you are unlikely to do, if you are a mentor that isn't comfortable um, or confident to mentor, you are unlikely to start coaching because you probably don't have the skills of a coach. So it's not like you are suddenly going to start coaching someone instead of mentoring them by mistake. 
you are more likely to start managing them because that's what you know how to do. And so for you as a manager, it's more important that you understand the difference between mentoring and managing. Um, so I hope that's useful. Uh, as we say, it's almost the wrong question. Um, the wonderful thing is you already have an existent, uh, an existing understanding of what it means to be a mentor. And that is innate within all of us because we have all experienced to greater or lesser extent a mentor in our lives, perhaps when we were young, perhaps in our, the earlier part of our career, perhaps you still have people that you recognize have a mentoring effect on you now. And so by experience, we have this innate understanding of what it felt like to be mentored by somebody of what it felt like to respect another person and be affected and influenced by that other person in what you would describe as a beneficial um, way so you have benefited from that relationship that you had and that could be a favorite aunt or uncle it could be your grandfather or your grandmother it could be a friend of the family it could be your favorite teacher I had a favorite teacher that mentored me in English um, it could be somebody in your early career so Sir John Whitmore was one of my definite mentors in, in my coaching career very obviously um, and I recognized that instinctively and it wasn't about behavior and it wasn't about any rules and it wasn't about a contract that was established between us. So you already have for yourself and perhaps it might be useful right now just to acknowledge who those people were or still are for you, um, a mentor, because mentor is an archetype and archetypes are something else that you already have um, an understanding of. So typically your traditional archetypes are things like the lover, the hero, the warrior, the ruler. Um, some of you that will have studied this as part of you know, psychology or, or some, co some kind of coaching skills thing, um, or even storytelling. Archetypes are used throughout storytelling, throughout fiction and fable and film. Archetypes are, are, a, are a strong underpinning to a good narrative. So archetypes, you already have an understanding of um, the phrase. I, you know, if, if I describe one of your management team as a warrior, you, I don't have to tell you much else about their style in the boardroom perhaps. Um, so mentor is an archetype. And, and again, you see mentor relationships, mentor-mentee relationships throughout film, fiction um, and fable. Um, so here's an obvious one, Mr. Miyagi um, and Daniel from The Karate Kid. Um, hopefully you've all seen that. If you haven't, I, I recommend it. Um, here's another one, Professor Dumbledore with Harry Potter. And if you remember, um, this is one of the archetypes we use in the book. Um, if you remember, Professor Dumbledore didn't always tell Harry what to do. He might provide him with a thought or he might provide some general guidance of advice or I don't know, something like an invisibility cloak, but he didn't tell him how to use the invisibility cloak. So their relationship is, is, is a great example. And of course it endures throughout, throughout the, uh, the books. Here's another one, a Star Wars example, Yoda, really obvious, obvious um, mentor, mentee archetypes. Um, a more modern day kind of, because I'm conscious those are all film and, and fiction. Um, here, these guys are literal mentors. Whether you love them, whether you hate them, um, never doubt that their intention as they go through the process that has been established by a, by a TV show is to mentor people for their success um, and possibly for mutual success. But hey, um, so that's a, that's a real um, life one. We talked about the relationship. The distinguishing characteristics, and this is one of the delights of writing the book that I unearthed, was the reason the mentor-mentee relationship is so powerful is that there is this exchange of benevolence and respect. And benevolence on the part primarily, does not, it doesn't have to be exclusively, but primarily from the mentor to the mentee and respect from the mentee to the mentor. And these, these are things that must be cultivated. And I know that where you're part of a workplace mentoring scheme, this can be a challenge. And we need to recognize this latent 
um, power, the synergy of influence here, contribution and influence of benevolence and respect. And indeed, for those of you that answered the poll and said, I'm thinking about being a mentor, quite often that comes to us as we have a sense of wanting to give back of wanting to contribute, of wanting to support the success of another. And aren't those all aspects of benevolence? And I believe that just, just that sense of yourself that you have can help you be successful um, and hopefully give you confidence as you go forward. Because kind of your heart is true in this and, and let that be the powerful element. Um, obviously, as I've said, this, this role gets morphed. Um, and, and practically so, um, you know, when organisations set up workplace mentoring schemes, um, it's a fantastic um, tool. Um, you know, it can be low cost or no cost um, way to develop people. And we must understand where in organisation, with every adaptation of the archetype, there is a compromise. And so a common one I see and, and would always discourage would be um, where a mentor becomes involved in the performance life cycle. So literally somebody's appraisal or bonuses or something or, or career progression is linked to um, some input, some formal input and contribution by a mentor, because that sets up a very unhelpful potentially dynamic where the mentor becomes overly invest, invested in what the mentee actually does as a result of the conversations and the mentee becomes a less willing participant to be open to um, you know to have comfortable disclosure um, because they are cautious that there's an influence here so um, not to make it too sinister because it doesn't have to be it's just for those of you that are either part of a workplace mentoring or considering using this, be aware with every, every compromise, every adaptation, everything the way you say, oh, well, we could get the mentors to do this, or we could have it be angled at um, succession planning or talent development or um, career progression or, you know, wherever it starts to be linked like that. It, it's a bit like taking a pipette and putting a drop of water into, a drop of color into clear water. We're just tainting it slightly. Um, and, and I, you know, I just wanted to make the observation. Um, so five principles that will guide you to help you navigate. For those of you that are currently, uh, are currently mentoring, you know, you've got your challenge, your opportunity, your question, you know, what, what's going on for you right now with mentoring. Perhaps there is something here that can help you compare and contrast your own experience. For those that those of you that aren't mentoring, this will help you orientate to the purpose of the role, to the attributes of the role. This is what a mentor um, is here to do. So as a mentor, you seek to empower other people. And you could compare that with a management role and say, well, isn't that what managers do? Um, yes and no. Um, with with um, a mentor role, you are looking to develop, to grow, to, to, to help support the development and growth of somebody else in order that they feel more resourceful, more confident, more resilient, more clear. Um, and that then starts to be slightly different than a, than a managing role where you're looking at the performance of somebody, the behaviours of somebody, setting up clear project management guidelines for somebody. That becomes more about task. This is not about task. This is not even about activity. This is about you having an innate sense of wanting somebody else to grow and thrive and and be resilient to their situations and con uh, conditions beyond the tenure of your relationship with them so that they you don't set up, and we talk about the pitfalls of mentoring in the book, the, the things that can go wrong, so that you don't set up this false dependence and reliance upon you as a mentor that somebody actually feels um, equipped to, con you know, to continue their journey, their career, um, their life um, without you. 
Guiding principle two, a mentor provides appropriate assistance. This is where we can really get start to get confused. And again, where we are altruistic as a mentor and where mentor, a mentor relationship has been set up with a very senior individual and a much more junior individual, there can be a false um, sense of obligation of the senior individual to help the more junior individual, the mentee, to be successful by perhaps introducing them, by getting them job interviews, by connecting them some way, by giving them information that they wouldn't ordinarily have. Um, remember, when we twin this with seeking to empower somebody else, sometimes by providing hands-on help, um, we're actually disempowering them. And a, and a really simple example might be somebody is, is considering a career change or putting in for another job, they want to do their CV. Um, what is the appropriate assistance as a mentor you should add to that situation? Should you help them write the CV, give them your CV, give them somebody else's CV, um, give them guiding principles instead. So not do the first two things, but give them guiding principles or offer to look at their CV or encourage that they, you know, they work with a professional profile writer. What is the appropriate assistance? And the answer is there isn't one answer. There isn't a right or wrong answer. There is simply your right answer, given the individual you are mentoring, cognizant of the um, purpose of empowering that individual. Sometimes, you know, if you sit sit side by side, you know, at the keyboard as they write through, and you you know you give them all the powerful adjectives and the super fabulous terms and help with the layout and form, it actually disempowers somebody. If you if you recognise um, actually they they need they need to learn to navigate this stuff on their own. They're depending. A little bit they're leaning on me a bit too much and um, then that that isn't appropriate with other people when they ask you know i could imagine um a young adult it might be entirely appropriate to sit by the side of them just to give them that confidence just to encourage them just to motivate them um, and to teach them some tips and tricks quickly around a word document and a, and a profile so you once you understand what you are there to do as a mentor this then helps you navigate to what the appropriate assistance is in any given situation. Guiding principle three. Mentoring is a collaboration between the mentor, the mentee and everyday life. And for those of you on the line that also coach, you, you might recognise this as well as, as something that happens in that one to one relationship as well. And um, what I'm pointing at here is where we begin a journey with somebody that we are mentoring we can we can become a little bit two-dimensional in our thinking and our mindset if we imagine that all the action is happening in those conversations and that there's a straight line that gets drawn between you know mentor session one mentor session two mentor session three mentor session four and quite often um you know, we start off with all good intentions. We set, you know, even in the best um, established process in terms of a, a, a mentoring assignment, we start off with all good intentions. We might even have gone into contracting, objection setting, you know, using um, some of the free downloads from the book to give us the agenda for the first meeting and the second meeting. We've gone through all of that. And then suddenly life takes a hand and the whole thing goes sideways. So perhaps a job comes up that they didn't realize that they wanted or they lose their current job or something happens at home or they have this sudden light bulb on that they want to completely change the nature of the relationship whatever it might be and um, they might go through something personally that's affecting their work um, i think it's good for us to recognize and trust in the process that mentoring is a collaboration between you, your mentee and everyday life and everyday life starts to play a part and it becomes almost um, magical and mystical, the things that start to happen in the, in the outside realm 
outside of the, the conversations, when, when people start to get clear and lined up behind what they do want, what they don't want, what they think, the insights and wisdoms that get surfaced from those conversations, or, ju or just the musings and, and, and general contemplation that comes out of that, um, things change is generally disturbed in the external environment. And so recognize that, accommodate that, stay resilient and resourceful to that. This is when an underpinning structure can really help. Um, guiding principle four, this relates to our ego. Um, what the mentee chooses to do as a result of the mentoring is not the mentor's business. Um, this is one that people get a bit testy with me about, and I can appreciate why. So, so we, I worded this carefully. This is one of those things that took forever for me to figure out what I wanted to say. I'm not saying that what the mentee chooses to do outside of the sessions is none of your business. I'm not saying don't be interested. I'm not saying it's nothing to do with you. I'm saying it's not the business of mentoring. And this is again where we start to separate from the role of a manager um, or even perhaps a coach is that I'm discouraging you from being as a mentor, from being invested in what the mentee chooses to do as the result of the mentoring. This is why it becomes an egoic principle because we have an opinion, we have a view, we want to see certain things happen for people. You know, when you, you, for those of you that with children, it's, it's how much do we want to be able to influence what courses they take at school, what, what, you know, what exams, that, what subjects they, they choose, what degree subjects that they might choose, what careers, options they might choose you know we become invested in that and where again we we um and this becomes an egoic thing with becoming a mentor where we have um an identity a story that we're telling ourselves about what it means to be a mentor and i'm supposed to have this productive positive um effect on this person's success and i don't see that what they you know they've just decided a career change that i don't see is what I would ever make or one that I would prescribe for them. And um, then we can start to get too emotionally invested. So it, it, if we think about the word facilitation and support and empowerment, that helps us again, navigate a lot more than thinking. So what are you gonna, you know, because it will drive your language. What are you gonna do after the session? What are you gonna do? And you might even want to get a list of actions um, which sounds a lot more like mentoring, doesn't it? It might be helpful to ask somebody what they've got from the session, um, what they, uh, what's been most useful, um, even what they think they might do, but not to get invested in any, you know, tasky, smart type, you know, specific, measurable um, actions and tasks, because that looks a lot more like mentoring, uh, managing, doesn't it? And um, fifth one. And again, I, I'm hoping these are these all kind of interlink. I'm hoping this kind of helps with the last one a little bit, which is to recognize a bit like, you know, there's three aspects of this. There's you, there's them and there's life. Um, some results of mentoring can be measured and others cannot. And another way of saying this is this wonderful quote by William Bruce Cameron that's often attributed to Einstein, by the way, but it's not Einstein's. Um, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. And if you think back to those people who have mentored you in your life, when you think about that formative impact somebody had upon you, whether it was you know, do the right thing, not the easy thing, whether it was to, um, I don't know, not go after being liked so much in situations, whether it was to be a little bit braver and a bold, bit bolder about asking for what you really want, whatever it might be, those become really intangible, don't they, in our lives. And so there's this unfortunate aspect to mentoring. And this is why, you know, it, it needs to be a heartfelt benevolence rather than any manufactured sense of um, you know outcome you you might never know the goodness that you had you might never know the impact that you had upon them sometimes it's lovely because people will come back and they will tell you they will explain to you um, 
but it's often intangible. You know, you could have you could have what you think is a no conversation. You went for a cup of tea. It was 45 minutes. It was all a bit rushed because they were late or you were late or you had to finish early. for And they could have just been, you know, if they bring the listening, there could just be one thing that was said, one story that was told that really landed. And you might not know why you were telling that story. You, you might not know why that story would land. And... I hope you get to hear some of those because it's lovely when that happens and, and give, give up the expectation that you ever will. The other reason why I point to this, um, especially in, in the, the context that the book is written, because it, it is primarily support workplace mentoring uh, or mentoring in the workplace, is that when, as a company, we want to set up a mentoring scheme, we often want to measure the results. And we want to measure them in terms of, you know, pr people's promotion and um, people's performance grades, the bonuses that they suddenly started or things that started to happen that they would directly connect or that were overtly connected back to the mentoring. And, you know, lots of lots of really well uh, run mentoring schemes want to do reviews and what did you get from the mentoring? A lot of that is how they how this individual made me feel or the um resourcefulness or resilience or comfort or confidence or clarity you know how do you measure those things but certainly the impact of those things on somebody's actions behavior mindset who they're being in the workplace is huge and this is why i'm delighted that mentoring seems to be really surging forward right now you know the the, the just the conversations we're involved in where people want to do this large scale um, I think only good can come of this. You know, it might be that you have a large mentoring scheme that, you know, around the edges or even, you know, by Pareto, that it doesn't look like it's been famously successful. But but it's it's obvious to everybody that's involved in terms of those relationships, in terms of how supported people feel, in terms of the connections that get made that then lead on by synchronicity to other things. Um, it, it's a hugely worthwhile endeavour. Um, okay, so a lot of talking from me there. Um, I'm conscious of my own voice. Uh, what are the most relevant ideas for you so far? I thought I'd give you just a moment um, to kind of distill all of that. We've got about five minutes left of me before we move back to Eloise for some questions. Um, but I just wanted to give you a moment you know, considering what you wanted to get from this, considering your current thoughts and activity with mentoring. Just grab those down. And, and again, there's something about this act of writing that just, you know, wires the brain a little bit to connect with the ideas so that they really do land. And if that's not what you expect, if it's a random thought, you know, great, you had it, grab it. Okay, so we talked about this criteria for successful mentoring, the principles that we operate from, you know, and this idea of empowerment, um, this idea of appropriate assistance, this idea of um, not everything can be measured. You know, these are all principles that we operate from. Um, I wanted to just flash up quickly the process, the journey that, that we work from from the book, um, and also talk a little bit about skills and ability. Um, skills and ability, we, I do focus on the core techniques of you know, of listening, of asking great questions. We tend to, with the work that we do in organizations and certainly for your own mentoring um, ability, there's this idea of the mindset that you are operating from, you know, what you think it means to be a mentor, of embodying that, of, of, of you know, allowing those attributes and principles of a good mentor um, to help you navigate. I'm, I'm also encouraging you to get what are traditionally called coaching skills, but actually all that we've done in the industry is wrap and package um, conversational skills. And so these, these skills would be skills of listening, um, skills of questioning, skills of building rapport and relationship, um, the ability to give constructive, helpful 
feedback. Um, those are all enablers. And for the coaches that are already on here, you know, people that have been have coach training, and I'm sure lots of you online have, um, you will see that those are everyday conversational skills. And, and almost it would be lovely if we could get rid of the term of branding those as, as coaching skills at some point, because they are life skills. They are, they are um, everyday conversational skills and abilities. Um, and so where we where we support people to mentor, managers and leaders to mentor, those are what we're giving people soon as um, in order to bolster what they're able to do in a conversation. And also it helps people be less directed, be less tell, give less advice and have less of this overlay of fixing and managing everything. Um, I wanted to talk to you about this, which is, which is an idea of process because this, un this underpinning of an effective process will help you be more successful as a mentor. And it will also help keep you clear. It will ground you in the base, back in the basics all the time. So when you know these kind of common derailment factors tend to happen after we've had this big flurry and, and you know, we're all giddy and we're in this honeymoon period of a relationship, it tends to be around conversation three, four, five, where we start to lose our sense of what we're doing. And within um, the mentoring manual, we, we work through this mentor map, which is, talks about setting up, so preparing to mentor, the activities within getting started, um, you know, the fulfilling, the navigate, maintain process to, to fulfill the practical functions of a mentor. And then this kind of setting down, this consolidating learning, starting to review what people are getting, starting to understand are we, you know, are we continuing and completing? Do we, or do we, um, you know, do we keep going? And then a, a way of parting the ways and completing the relationship because that has to be tidy as well. That has to be some, and some I absolutely acknowledge, some mentoring relationships are open-ended and indeed, I, the, primarily my pro bono mentoring relationships are open-ended um, and, and follow this perhaps a little less, although still have elements of this within them. Um, so this is the mentor map. Um, there, is, there is also, as well as we've got this in the book, there's lots of free downloads that help support this in terms of agendas, review, reflection templates that are all there um, on the Learn Style website for you to take. So. Um, you may already have that. So within a formal mentoring scheme, you might not need that because you might already have been given that by um, whoever's setting up the scheme. But it's just, it's a really useful way to give you confidence and clarity to think, what am I actually doing here? Because there are common derailment factors and, and sometimes it just creates, it's because we haven't set up the relationship clearly. We've all got confused about what we're here to do. I, I, don't know how to add value in the conversation. I don't know what value I am adding in the conversation, not because I'm not adding any value, just, just I don't have the cognizance of that because we haven't had that feedback conversation. Um, so have a look at that. Um, that's me, phew. I'm done. Eloise, you need to liberate me from my slides. <laughs> Let's go Thank to a you. Q and A. Thank Let you, Julie, see. that was really good. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've been making notes myself. I thought those the principles were, were, were really good at sort of, yeah, how we think about the difference between mentoring and coaching. Fantastic. Great. Yeah, so, yeah, over to the questions. And um, there's still time if you want to add anything. Um, and I know you've covered this one already a little bit, but yes. um, we, we did have a question right at the start about what is the difference between coaching and mentoring? So if you, I don't know, if you could just quickly give, one line just to, to sum that up. Um, in addition to what I've already said, so I, I want to acknowledge it's not helpful to try and distinguish it at a behavioral level. So, so, so a highly skilled coach is recognizably good at avoiding being overly directive in a conversation. So using the techniques of listening, questioning, giving observations, using summaries, in order to facilitate somebody's thought processes. That's what we are skilled at doing. Um, and so sometimes people say, as a coach, you should never tell, you should never advise, you should never you know, give ideas into a situation, which patently is, is um, unhelpful. Um, by the same level of thinking, 
we quite often imagine that mentors are, are mentoring somebody because they have relevant skills, relevant experience, and like a cookie cutter, you know, I've run, you know, I've run a small to medium enterprise in manufacturing. You're starting off, um, you know, with this conscious T-shirt brand. And so I'm going to overlay 30 years of my experience by telling you what I think you should do to grow your business. Now, even as I say it, it sounds bizarre. And, you know, in today's retail environment with digital marketing and, and such like, sounds sounds like, why would you assume that? But that mentor might have been given that expectation. And so you can see where that starts to come unstuck. So at behavioral level, it's not useful. What's more useful is to talk about the distinctions and characteristics of a relationship and to understand the intentions of a mentor. So to empower, to provide appropriate assistance, um, to, to stay attuned to the needs of the individual. You know, those are all, you know, the modern mentor, not perhaps Dumbledore, or, or maybe perhaps Dumbledore, I don't know, you'd have to ask Dumbledore, you know, how he navigated how his responses to Harry Potter. Um, but certainly the, the intention, the purpose, and this synergy of benevolence and respect. Respect is, if, if I respect you, you know, by um, default, I am willing to be influenced by you. If I feel benevolent towards you, I have compassion, I want to encourage you, I, I, I feel this heartfelt sense of, of service to you in a way, because I want the best for you. And those are, those are all more helpful things to help people feel comfortable about what they're doing here because it isn't straightforward especially where the you know in the workplace we've taken this term and kind of bastardized it to make make you know to fit the modern workplace and you know called it it and that's why i'm saying with every adaptation is a compromise to that sure sure thank you okay. Jude. thank you and um, Here's another one. How can you overcome a lack of motivation in mentees? Aha, we talk about that. I, did, I nearly put a slide in on that, but it was too much. Um, you're looking for engagement. So one, something that helps, this is where effective process, this mentor map, this journey can really help because where you spend the time to understand your mentee, to understand what drives them, to understand what they're out for, then you are more likely to be able to stay attuned to that, work with that, and, and get what we call this, you know, higher level of engagement. Um, so, so what Nina um, is saying is a lack of motivation. What she's, what she's probably also pointing at is disengagement, like maybe sat shrugging in conversations, like, I'm not getting a great deal from this, or when they give feedback via HR or whatever, they might go, yeah, it's like, um, you know, nice conversations, but not very relevant to me. Well, if we haven't set it up around, amongst clear expectations, or the mentor, mentee doesn't actually want to be mentored, then that is more likely. And of course, um, we, it, it can be an insolvable issue where the mentee is convinced that they want the senior famous celebrity leader to coach them they didn't get that person they got the new guy that's just come in from some random company they don't know and they've been given this person to mentor instead and they wanted this fabulous woman from you know the upper echelons and so they might sit with their arms folded and think well, I'm, you know i don't know why i'm doing this i don't know what i'm getting from this um, we sometimes work with mentees and we, we encourage mentees um, to operate from a principle, again, to navigate by, which is you might not get the mentor that you thought you wanted, but you will get the one that you needed. And where you operate from that, you, you kind of put this more positive filter of possibility on the relationship, which says, I'm not quite sure what I could get from these conversations, but I know that if I bring the listening, if I bring the questioning, if I bring the intention, 
then I'm more likely to find it than if I sit disappointed, you know, writing off this individual because you haven't, you've not spent 10 years in our business. You don't know our culture. You don't know the strategy. You're just new like everybody else. Um, and don't see the potential value in that. So, so I think that to try and give us kind of distill that is understand what's really going on and understand if that's a fault of clarity and objective and purpose setting up front or understand whether it's, it's, it's an unsolvable thing and then step back. Let's not waste everybody's time because the mentor's time is, is as valuable as the mentees. Mm. Yes, yes. We, we want to come to things with a sort of open mindset, don't we? We don't, yeah. well, we don't want to be fixed. Uh, here's another one. Is it advisable or possible to helpfully mix coaching and mentoring within a relationship or session? Um, we do hybrid coaching and mentoring. So I think the question itself might be a bit confused because what I'm saying is a good mentor has these coaching skills. So yes, but let's not call it two different things. Because remember, in the coaching profession, and I'm a bit to blame for this, we, we have wrapped and packaged, you know, the skills start from the coaching manual. It's listening, it's questioning, it's constructive feedback, it's rapport building, it's all those good things. We've, we've kind of put those in a box and said, oh, these are our, these are coaching skills. And the ability to be less direct and the ability to facilitate a conversation. Um, but those are not with, you know, the, the, the coaching profession doesn't own those. Let's give mentors great conversational skills and allow them to use them. And that will mean, of course, as you're saying, you're coaching and you're mentoring. You're not coaching and mentoring. You're just having a really great conversation with somebody born from a clear understanding of the relationship you you have you are equipped by great great listening skills you are equipped by the ability to ask open purpose-based questions you are equipped by the ability to give constructive feedback and make helpful observations and point at things and let's not call that coaching or mentoring let's just call that a really great conversation by someone that's got a skill in interpersonal conversations Love it, love it, yeah. Here's another one. Um, what are your thoughts on asking mentees well into the relationship what they thought worked well for them and what was not so helpful? I think it's essential. I think it's essential. In fact, one of our free downloads is a review meeting that gives you an agenda for doing just that, which is, you know, what's working well? Because how can a mentor, this is, you know, you go into it's we can put all sorts of pressure on ourselves as a mentor. It's like we have to be something like perfect and all things to all people and, you know, this guiding, shining light. Um, and, of course, that's really unhelpful um, because it, it places pressure and it makes you effort. And, and, you know, we go into this illusory sense of what's really going on. So just ask, just ask, what, what do I do that works? What do I do that works less? What would you like more of? What would you like less of? How could we make these sessions better? You know, just these open generative questions that give you something back in terms of an understanding and, and prepared to be surprised and delighted at the simple things you do that add the most value to the individual, like providing a safe space to download, like um, your constant care, like your consistency with them, like the fact that you're really different and speak differently, look different, um, are different, and that they seem to never understand you, that they actually get an awful lot. So while you're sat with your egoic self judging, thinking they just look confused the whole time, they just look completely befuddled, I don't know what's going on with this person, they don't give me any visual feedback that's, that's helpful. Behind that, they might be thinking, oh, gosh, this, you know, this person is so different and I really need to learn from this. Because... This sense is so flawed, you know, this kind of illusory sense where we talk to ourselves and invent what we think might be going on in the minds of other people. Yeah, absolutely. Ask, review regularly. 
love it love it um okay i'm conscious of time but oh, i'll, I'll yeah. keep going I'll, I'll i'll keep um asking a few more um so i usually think of mentoring as a long-term relationship um where hopefully you'll see their progress but what do you think is sort of the minimum amount of time that that relationship could could happen for this is really difficult because there's only what i see happening and i agree with that individual it, it's so it's so much more um, gratifying um, when you can when you can have an enduring relationship. And indeed, some like I say, some of my pro bono ones especially last, last, last. Um, and organizational schemes sometimes want to boundary that. And that's a helpful thing to do because there's a certain application. So it could be new starters get a mentor for their first six months or um, people promoted to a certain level get a much more senior mentor for, for their first year. Um, and, and so it's, it, it has a boundary around it that's useful. And it's useful for me to navigate thinking, OK, we've got a beginning, middle and end to this, and that's a 12 month window. So it, it, there are only how it, there's only how it's been set up with the intentions and purpose that should really drive. I think the the nature of it, but again, these review sessions can help with that because that one of the, the outcomes of a review session, you know, after six months, might be well, let's just have three more sessions and then complete, rather than just leave this open ended, and then that's going to more more likely motivate your mentee to get the most out of those three final sessions, um, because you know, mentors mentors can. This is a pitfall of being a mentor. We love to mentor, we love the idea of being a mentor, we want to contribute and give back, especially if we're in the later stages of our career. We can over promise and then end up becoming overwhelmed by you know, having three or four people to mentor. We thought that sounded easy and it sounds like too much. Um, so there's no right and wrong answer. And I agree with the individual, a longer relationship is, is more satisfying somehow, I think, as long as both parties are, you know, like in a relationship, both parties are still enjoying themselves. Yes, yes, where there's uh, consent on both sides. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> right, I, I'm going to, we've got a few more questions, but I, I'm going to stop because I'm conscious of yes, time. And absolutely. We don't, want, we don't want to overrun. So, so um, thank you, Julie. Um, I've got one more slide um, just to show um, the ways you can keep in touch with, with you. Uh, here we go. Hopefully you can oh, see that. that. Yes, yes. Great, oh, great. So we've got your, your LinkedIn page and you're also on Twitter. And um, you've mentioned the website as well. And I know you've got um, loads of fabulous stuff on there. Yes. So, again, yeah, there's Star Coaching and there's also Lone Star, which is our learning portal. Fab, fab. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending and for anyone watching on demand. Um, I hope you'll tune into our next session, which is on Tuesday, the 25th of October at 2 p.m. UK time. Um, our book of the month will be How to Lead by Joe Owen, and his masterclass will be on making hybrid working work. A bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Um, so um, please sign up to the mailing list and hope to see you next time. And Julie, thank you so much again. It's been, it's been fantastic. I loved it. Thanks, Eloise. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye.